أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الهداة المهديين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى يوم الدين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد كتبنا في الزبور من بعد الذكر أن الأرض يرثها عبادي الصالحون صدق الله العلي العظيم Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We mentioned last night as we spoke about Al Ghaybat al Sughra, the minor Ghaybah occultation of our 12th Imam, Al Imam al Mahdi, Ajjalallahu ta'ala farajahu al Sharif, that this period, Al Ghaybat al Sughra, ended with the death of the fourth ambassador, Ali ibn Muhammad al Samari. Imam al-Mahdi, as we mentioned, the hadith says, he sent him a letter and he told him, do not appoint anyone after you. And this period of al-Ghaybat al-Sughra has ended and the next period, al-Ghaybat al-Kubra has begun. Now, what exactly is the difference between al-Ghaybat al-Sughra and al-Kubra and why are there two? Why do we have two terms for them? Why can't it just be one? The first difference between al-Ghaybat al-Sughra and al-Ghaybat al-Kubra is that Al Ghaybat al Sughra was short. It was 69 to 70 years. And it ended with the death of the last of the ambassadors. But Al Ghaybat al Kubra is much, much longer. Now, how long is it? Only Allah knows. Because up until this very second, we are still living in Al Ghaybat al Kubra. So far, it has been 1,108 years since Al Ghaybat al Kubra began. How long will it be? How long will it be before this period ends and the Imam reappears? Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. And that's why we have in our hadith, in one hadith from Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam, which is Sahih, he says, Lilqaimi ghaybatan. The Imam al Mahdi, Allah farajah al Sharif, will have two ghaybas. This is Imam al Sadiq, 100 years before Imam al Mahdi. He will have two ghaybas. Ihdahuma qasira. He says one is short, al ghaybat al sughra and the second is long. And we mentioned Imam al-Mahdi himself in the tawqi' of Ali ibn Muhammad al-Samari when he told him you're going to die in six days. He said, فَقَدْ وَقَعَتِ الْغَيْبَةُ التَّامِّ So the Imam said, now the full ghayba, the new long ghayba will begin. So these are terms taken from the ahadith. We did not make them up. So that's the first difference between al ghaybat al sughra and al ghaybat al kubra One is long, the other is short. The second and most important difference is what happened during the Ghaybas. We mentioned that during Al Ghaybat al Sughra, Imam al Mahdi appointed direct specific ambassadors, four ambassadors that served as gateways between the Shia and between the Imam. The Shia could indirectly reach the Imam through the ambassadors. We said that for over 250 years, the Shia of Ahl Bayt they were used to going and speaking to the Imams directly. When the small ghaybah began, al ghaybah al sughra things changed. No longer anyone can meet the imam directly. Now you can only access the imam indirectly. But when al ghaybah al sughra ended and al ghaybah al kubra began in the year 329 after Hijrah, things changed. No one could access the imam even indirectly because the imam no longer had any ambassadors, specific ambassadors to represent to them. Yes, the imam has general ambassadors and general, let's say, representatives in this Ghaybat al-Kubra that I'll speak about, but specific ambassadors that we can reach the Imam through in al-Ghaybat al-Kubra, this changed. It was no longer available. And that's why when al-Ghaybat al-Kubra began, it was a very difficult time for the Shia because now not only we cannot see the Imam, not only we can't meet the Imam, not only we cannot directly access him, we can no longer indirectly access him. I can't send a letter and receive the answer. So we can ask questions from the Imam and receive the answers. We can no longer, for example, know about the information and the lifestyle about the Imam. And that's why many things about Imam al-Mahdi in al-Ghaybat al-Kubra, we don't know. Many people ask, where does Imam al-Mahdi live in al-Ghaybat al-Kubra? 
We don't know. Why? Because there is no communication between us. We have no means of reaching him. How does the Imam spend his time in Ghaybat in Kubra? We don't know. Is the Imam married? Does he have children? All of these matters about the personal life of the Imam are we're ignorant of. We don't know because that's it. We've lost connection to the Imam. And likewise, you find this was a difficult time for the Shia because we said in Al Ghaybat al Sughra, if there were any imposters that what? That used to pose themselves as ulama, or some of the ulama, they would deviate, the Imam right away, he would condemn them. He would issue a letter. He would tell the Shia, be careful. This person is not a true alim. He would give them a warning. But when the Ghaybat al Kubra started, there's. The Imam is no longer available for us. He no longer issues statements for us and tells us which alim is true, which alim must be followed, and which alim must not be followed. And that's why you see there's so much chaos today. You see, for example, you go to Iraq. So many people claim they are maraja. So many people claim that they are what? Representatives of Imam al-Mahdi. You have one, for example, by the name of al-Sarkhi, a man who claims he is a marja. He lives in Iraq. A man that claims that he is the representative of Imam al-Mahdi. He is Waliya Amr al muslimi He is the guardian of the Muslims. And he cannot even read one ayah correct. Ask him to read one ayah correct, he can't read it. Ask him one question, he cannot answer you. And unfortunately, what bothers you is that these people have followers. Another person that we have today, because the Imam is in the state of full ghaybah and he's not issuing letters and statements telling us that these people are imposters, is another person in the city of Al-Basra by the name of Ahmad Gwata. You've heard of him. He claims one day that he is the grandson of Imam Al-Mahdi. He claims one day that he's the messenger. One day he claims that he's the Safir of Imam Al-Mahdi. So all of a sudden we have a fifth Safir of Imam Al-Mahdi. One day he claims he's the Yamani. The Yamani that he appears before Imam Al-Mahdi reappears. Every day he's changing his what? He's changing his claims. And once again you have people following them. Unfortunately, this is what hurts. That the Shia, so many times in history, they're so naive and gullible. That whoever comes and says, I'm a alim, I'm a marja, I'm this, I'm that. They go and they follow him. They do not use what? Their aql, their wisdom, their hikmah to differentiate between a true alim, a true marja, and these decoys, and these imposters who claim their maraja. And unfortunately, some of them, when you ask them, why did you follow this person in Basra Gweta, who claims to be Yamani? They tell you, because I saw a dream. Your entire faith, you're building it and formulating on a dream that probably you ate, probably you had a burrito before you slept and then you saw that dream. This is your deen, this is your religion. And that's why you see Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, he speaks about some of us unfortunately. He says, النَّاسُ ثَلَاثَ There's three types of people. عَالِمٌ Rabbani, The true alim. For example, Ahlul Bayt. وَمُتَعَلِّمٌ عَلَىٰ سَبِيلِ نَجَاتِ And then the wise Shia, they know, they look at the hadith of Ahl bayt and they can differentiate between haqq and batil. And then he says, وَهَمَجٌ رَعَىٰ The mobs, the mobs that are, that are out of control. هَمَجٌ رَعَىٰ They're just like sheep, they go in any direction you point towards. يَمِيلُونَ مَعَ كُلِّ نَاحِقْ They go after anyone, just like the wind, left and right. They have no standards. They have no way of telling what's right and wrong. And that's why you find the time of Ghaybat al-Kubra that we live in today is a very critical and difficult time. Because the Imam is no longer in that position to lead us. The Imam is with us. He is present. But the Imam does not issue statements in telling us follow this person or follow that person. And the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, because they knew how difficult Zaman al-Ghaybat al-Kubra will be, they spoke in many ahadith about this, like I mentioned yesterday. One hadith I will read for you. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, he spoke about Ghaybat al-Kubra. And he told the Shia, beware of Ghaybat al-Kubra. It will be a difficult time because the Imam will not be up there for you to lead you. So what did the Imam say in the hadith? He said, لِلْقَائِمِ مِنَّا غَيْبَةٌ يَطُولُ أَمَدُهَا The Qa'im amongst us, Imam al-Mahdi, عَجَّلَ اللَّهِ فَرَجَهُ الشَّرِيف he will go in a state of ghayba, occultation, and it will be a very long, very long period. So far it's been over what? Over 1200 years, Imam is in the ghayba. And then the Imam says, Ka'anni bishia. He speaks about the Shia. This is Imam Ali, hundreds of years before Imam Mahdi. Ka'anni bishia. Yajulun jawalan al ni'ami fi ghaybatah. Yatlibun al mar'a fala yajudun. The Shia, do you, do you see the example he gives, the analogy? He says, the Shia and al ghaybat al-Kubra, they will be like sheep, lost sheep. Looking for the grassland. They don't know where to go, this way, 
this way, the other way. And then he says, يَطْلِبُونَ الْمَرْعَى فَلَا يَجُنَا They're looking for the right way, the shepherd, the grass line. They cannot find it. It's a difficult time because the imam is not there to guide us. This is one hadith from Imam Ali alayhi salam that shows you the difficulties of this period, al ghaybat al-Kubra. A second hadith from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. This, this hadith is even more extreme. It shows you how difficult ghaybat al-Kubra is. He tells his companion al-Mufaddal ibn Umar one day. He tells him, Ya Mufaddal, أَمَا وَاللَّهِ لَيَغِيبَنَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ أَوْ لَيَغِيبَنَّ الْقَائِمْ مِنَّا Allahu Akbar. This is Imam al-Sadiq, Imam Ali. They're telling us about the ghaybah of the Imam. لَيَغِيبَنَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ لَيَغِيبَنَّ الْقَائِمْ مِنَّا And then the Imam tells Mufaddal about how difficult it will be. أَمَا وَاللَّهِ لَيَغِيبَنَّ الْقَائِمْ سِنِينًا مِنْ دَهْرِكُمْ He will go in the ghaybah for many, many years. And then he says, وَلَتُمَحُّصَنَّا and you will be tried, you will be tested, your iman will be tested, and, and the things will reach a point in which people will say, People will say, where is Imam Mahdi? Why is he taking so long? The ghaybah is taking too long. People will say, Imam Mahdi died. Imam Mahdi is not there. He does not even exist. So people, they will begin to have doubts about Imam al-Mahdi, Allah farajahu sharif and then the Imam, he said these words. He said, As for the Mu'mineen, the true believers, they will cry for Imam Mahdi. Because they will see Imam Mahdi is not coming. They will say, when will you come? Ya Sahib al-Zaman. Ya Sahib al-Zaman. Al-Aman, Al-Aman, Al-Aman min fitan al-Zaman. There are so many fitan and difficulties in Ghaybat al-Kubra. When will you come and save us from all this chaos? This is what? This is the believers. And then he says, Look at how difficult Ghaybat al-Kubra is. He says, If you see a ship in the ocean, and it's in the middle of the ocean, it's in the middle of a hurricane. Do you see how the waves keep on slapping it and taking it left and right? He says, this is how you will be in Al-Ghaybat al-Kubra. The fitan of Al-Ghaybat al-Kubra, they will take you left and right like you're in the middle of a hurricane. This is how difficult it is. And then he says, And there will be, the Imam says, 12 standards. Each standard within the Shia saying, I am right, you are wrong. They fight within each other. When you look, you don't know which one is the true. And then the Imam says, And then Who will be saved? Who will be spared? In al al Kubra, in the middle of all these fitan and difficulties, the Imam, Imam al Sadiq, said only those people who are true believers, who have true Iman in their hearts, they have no doubt, strong conviction in their aqa'ad, in their beliefs, they will not be affected. They're like mountains, nothing can move them. So Al Mufaddal, when he heard this hadith, he began to cry. He said, Ya Imam al Sadiq, are you serious? A time will come in which this is how hard it will become for the Shia that they will be like ships inside a hurricane and there will be 12 standards. So then he said, what do we do? What will the Shia do in that time? They'll all be lost. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Look at the beautiful answer because here we're about to lose hope, yes? Once we read the hadith up to this point, we begin to lose hope, then khalas, we're all doomed, yes? No. The Imam says, look, if you want to be guided, the haqq is clear. The problem is with us Shia, we don't follow the orders of the Imams. We don't read their ahadith. If you do close your eyes and you don't look, of course you're going to be misguided. The Imam, he pointed at a window. There was a window in the room and there was some sunlight coming. The rays of the sunlight, they were coming inside the room. He told him, Ya Mufaddal, do you see the sunlight? He said, yes, of course. Who, who, who wouldn't see it? Only a blind person can see it. He said, Wallah, inna amrana la abyanu min hadihi shams. He says, Wallah, Ya Mufaddal, amrana. The true path of Ahlul Bayt and al ghaybat al-Kubra is clearer than the sun. It's clearer than the sun. You just have to open your eyes and look. Unfortunately, sometimes, because we do not follow the teachings of Ahl Bayt, we don't read the ahadith to see who's the right alim, what to do in al ghaybat al-Kubra. I have one lecture, entire lecture. What are we supposed to do in al ghaybat al-Kubra? We have so much ahadith from Ahl Bayt. When I close my eyes and I don't look, of course I'm going to be lost. When an alim, an imposter comes and says, I'm an alim, and I don't go back to the ahadith of Ahl Bayt to see who is a true alim, who's not. I don't use my mind, my intellect, my wisdom. Of course, I'm going to be lost. So, but 
if I use my intellect, my wisdom, and I go back to the ahadith of Ahl bayt then the truth will be simpler and will be clearer and more crisp than the sun. So the Imam gives us hope once again. But at the end of the day, this time, al ghaybatul kubra is a very difficult time for us to be in. But however, Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam, they knew these difficulties are there. They did not leave us to, to go astray. They did not just leave us like that. No, they gave us guidelines. They did two things. The first thing we spoke about yesterday, Imam al-Mahdi is not available now. If I have a question about fiqh, halal haram, I have a question about, for example, the aqaid, my belief system, about the imams, about the Qur'an. Now I can't go to the imam directly nor indirectly because there's no ambassadors today of the imam. But however, the earlier imams, the preceding imams, they what? All their ahadith are mentioned in the books and the books are available today. So if I have a question, a concern about my religious affairs, I go back to the ahadith of Al-Baqir, Al-Sadiq, Al-Ridha, Al-Kadhim. And they, there are thousands of ahadith, like I mentioned, Bihar Al-Anwar, 110 volumes, all ahadith of Ahadith. Wasa'il al-Shi'a, 30 volumes, all the ahkam of halal and haram. How to pray, how to fast, how to give your khumus, how to do the, the marriage, the talaq, the divorce, so on and so forth, how to do a transaction. 30 volumes, ahadith of Ahl bayt So you can't say Ahl bayt left us without any knowledge. No, go back to the ahadith of Imam al-Sadiq, Imam al-Baqir, and it's all there. So that's the first thing they did. They made sure their ahadith are available for the Shia in Zaman al-Ghaybat al-Kubra. So we can't say we're lost. That's number one. Number two, the second thing Ahlul Bayt did for us in Al Ghaybat Al Kubra so that we are not lost is they appointed general representatives for us to follow. What do I mean? Yesterday, we said that during the lives of the Imams, they would sometimes appoint certain people to what? To give fatwa, to collect khums. Like we said, Imam Al Baqir appointed Aban ibn Taghlib. Imam al-Sadiq appointed Abu Basir, Muhammad ibn Muslim, Imam al-Rada Zakariya ibn Adam, and so on and so forth, Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman. Now, in these instances, the Imams would directly appoint them by their names. Go to Fulan, son of Fulan. Likewise, Imam al-Mahdi in al-Ghaybat al-Sughra, he had four ambassadors. He directly appointed them by their names. Al-Ghaybat al-Kubra, the Imams do have representatives, but not specific representatives. Meaning the Imams didn't mention Fulan will be my representatives. They gave a general title, a general criteria. Whoever meets the criteria, automatically they will be the representatives of the Imams. And this is where we get into the topic of Marja'iyyah. We mentioned yesterday, some ignorant people, they say the Shia, they made up Marja'iyyah. There's no such thing as marja. I proved yesterday through the ahadith that no, marja'iyah existed since the time of Imam Baqir. He told Aban, sit in the masjid and give fatwa. He told Muhammad ibn Muslim, Imam al-Sadiq. Imam al radha told some of his companions. So this existed since the time of the Imams. And likewise, we have ahadith from our a'imma telling us that in the time of al-ghayba, then you have to go back to the maraja', the ulama, and they will be our representatives on your behalf. And I'll mention two ahadith about this. So if any time someone asks you, where do you get the marja'iyah from? From the imams themselves. One hadith, memorize this, from Imam al-Hasan al-Askari alayhi salam. This is a very famous and very, very crisp and clear hadith. Very obvious. What does the imam say before I mention it? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. In this hadith, it's narrated that Imam al-Askari alayhi salam, he told his Shia this. They, he knows that his son will go into a state of ghaybah. So what did the Shia do? He gave them this general principle to live by. What did he tell them? He told them this hadith. It's a very famous hadith. فَأَمَّا مَنْ كَانَ مِنَ الْفُقَهَاءِ صَائِلًا لِنَفْسِهِ حَافِظًا لِدِينِهِ مُخَالِفًا لِهَوَاهِ مُطِيعًا لِأَمْرِ مَوْلَاهِ it's very crisp and very clear. The Imam says that you during this in the state of Ghaybah, you, you do not have the Imam, do not worry. I will appoint general representatives. Who is my representatives? He said anyone who has these two criteria, he will be my representative. He, my Imam can have a hundred representatives, of thousands. So who is the representative of the Imam? Two criteria. Number one, any person that wants to be my representative, he has to be fuqaha. Man kana min al fuqaha. He has to be a faqih. Faqih means what? Means a scholar. He has to be alim. 
He has to study the Quran. He has to study the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, halal and haram. So that's number one. This is common sense. If you want to be a representative of Imam, you have to know their ulum, their knowledge. This is number one. Number two, the Imam, he said he has to be adil. Hafidhan li deelah, mukhalifan li hawa, muti'an li amrullah. He has to be just and he has to have taqwa, fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I can't follow someone that who, who does not fear Allah, does haram. No, he has to be just. If these two criteria are met, Imam Hassan al-Askari, in this hadith, he said what? فَلِلْ عَوَامْ أَنْ يُقَلِّدُوا The awam, meaning the general public of the Shia, then they can follow this narja. يُقَلِّدُوا He used the word taqlid, he used the word awam, he used the word faqih. So this is a very obvious, crisp, clear hadith from Imam al-Askari alayhi salam to guide us Shia during al-Ghaybat al-Kubra. We go back to the ulama. So this is number one. Number two, the second hadith, we have many, I'll just mention these two. The second hadith that we have from the Imams about doing taqlid and going back to our maraja in Ghaybat al-Kubra so that we know what's halal haram, we preserve our faith, is a hadith from Imam al-Mahdi himself. In al-Ghaybat al-Sughra, one of the tawqi'at, we said Imam al-Mahdi would issue letters called tawqi'at. One of the tawqi'at that al-Shaykh al-Tusi narrates in his book al ghaiba is a letter that Imam al-Mahdi sent to the Shia. And amongst the things Imam al-Mahdi said in this tawqi' is this. He said these words exactly. He said, وَأَمَّا الْحَوَادِثْ الْوَاقِعَ They asked him, Ya Imam al-Zaman, after you go after the ambassador, the fourth ambassador, in our religious affairs, who do we go back to? You will be in the state of full ghayb. Who do we go back to? Refer us to someone. The Imam said this, أَمَّا الْحَوَادِثْ الْوَاقِعَ In your religious affairs, فَارْجِعُوا فِيهَا إِلَىٰ رُوَاتِ حَدِيثِنَا Go back to whom? To the narrators. رُوَاتِ حَدِيثِنَا is the narrators. Those people that narrate the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt. And then the Imam says, فَإِنَّهُمْ حُجَّتِي عَلَيْكُمْ وَأَنَا حُجَّةُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِمْ They are my representatives for you, my, my proof for you, and I am Allah's proof for them and against them. Very beautiful hadith from Imam al-Mahdi Go back to the narrators. Now you may object here. You may say Imam al-Mahdi said narrators. He did not say fuqaha ulama. So we go back to the narrators. Now, this objection, we could obviously understand the answer to this. Just think to yourself, would Imam al-Mahdi tell us to go back to a narrator that does not understand what he's narrating? Or he would tell you to go back to a narrator that understands what he's narrating. Which one? Obviously Imam al-Mahdi wouldn't tell you go back to a narrator that doesn't understand what he's narrating. Or else he'll be like whom? Quran gives an example. The Holy Quran says he'll be like a donkey. We read in Surah Al-Jum'ah, كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُ asfara. Some people, they just say something, they memorize things, but they don't understand it. The Quran says they are like donkeys. A donkey, you can put so many books on his back. No one will carry as much as a donkey, trust me. One day have a competition with a donkey, he can carry much more books than you can. But will the donkey understand what's in the books? The contents of the book? Nothing. He's a donkey. He carries it from point A to point B, doesn't understand anything. So if I go back to a narrator that doesn't understand what he's narrating, he'll be just like a donkey, there's no worth. The Imams want us to go to a narrator that understands what he's narrating. And this is the ulama. Go to the Hawza today. You see the ulama. The whole time from Subuh till Maghrib time, they are what? They are studying the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt. They're narrating them. And they are trying to figure out what did the Imam mean in this hadith? Is this hadith sahih or is it da'if? If there are two ahadith that are conflicting each other, how can we solve this confliction to arud between the ahadith? And that's why the ulama are the narrators that Imam al-Mahdi told us to go back to anytime we have questions or concerns in our religious affairs. So this is the second thing that our imams did in order to ensure that we're not lost. That's why we have to pay respect to our ulama. Do not disrespect them. Do not undermine the, the knowledge of the ulama, the true ulama in the Hawza. Because Imam al-Mahdi says that they are my hujjah against you. And if you speak against the hujjah of Imam al-Mahdi, it's as if you have spoken against the Imam himself. Now these are the true ulama. Remember we said there's always imposters and there's the true ulama. We have to always make sure we follow the true and the good ulama. So... These are two steps that the Imam took in order to make sure that we during Al-Ghaybatul Kubra 
were not lost. Now, there are a few questions that come to our mind. And there's a few misconceptions that are always raised about Imam al-Mahdi in the time of al-Ghaybat al-Kubra. And many people, sometimes our enemies, sometimes other Muslims from other schools of thought, sometimes Christians and Jews, they ask us these questions about Imam Mahdi. They raise it as a misconception. How do we answer them? And we have to always what? We have to always know the answer and know how to reply. I'll mention five. Five misconceptions about Imam al-Mahdi or five important questions and I will answer them tonight and over the course of the next few nights. So we begin with the first question. Now, Imam al-Mahdi Sharif, is alive amongst us. Yes? Yes. When was the Imam born? He was born in the year 255. What year is it now? In the Hijri calendar? 1437. So that would make the Imam how old? How old? That would make the Imam close to 1300 years old, correct? Maybe 1280, something like that. Now, many people will tell you, especially some other Muslims from other schools of thought, they'll tell you, how can you believe in an Imam that's living for over a thousand years old? This doesn't make sense. This is a myth. This is fiction. You truly believe in an Imam that's 1200 years old? How can that be? And they sometimes, they begin to mock us because of the long age of Imam al-Mahdi. Now, how do we reply to this? Very quick, easy reply. Number one, you tell them that this is not natural. We're not saying the Imam just naturally lived all this time. We say this is a miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's easy for him to let a human being live 10,000 years, 20,000 years. So number one, do not undermine the power of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he wants any one of us to live for forever, just like in Jannah, we will live for forever. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can prolong the life of any human being for any age that Allah wants. All he has to say is, kun, be, and it will be. So that's number one. This is not natural, this is a miracle. Number two, you tell them why are you mocking Imam Mahdi when you also believe in other human beings that lived a long age. Like whom? Every Muslim believes that Nuh lived thousands of years. Our ahadith say that Nuh lived for 2,500 years. How is that possible? Isn't this a joke? How can you believe in a prophet that lived 2,500 years? The Quran says Nuh spent 950 years just with his tribe. Isn't this fiction? Isn't this a myth? Isn't this a joke? If you want to speak with this mentality, then you have to disbelieve in Nuh. Number one, Nuh, you tell them. Number two, Adam, our ahadith tell us Adam lived for 930 years. So this is a long age. How come you believe in Adam? This is number two. So these are two prophets that died. They live a long age. Number two, we have many prophets that are still alive today. And they believe in them. All Muslims believe in them. Like who? For example, we have Al-Khidr. Al-Khidr, some say he's a prophet, some say he was a wise man, not a prophet. The point is all Muslims accept that Al-Khidr is alive today. And he was before Islam. He was, he was during the time of Musa. So if how old is he right now? He's probably four or five thousand years old right now. You believe in a four or five thousand year old Khidr, but you don't believe Imam Mahdi because he's one thousand years old? This is what? This is a contradiction. This, is, this doesn't make sense. So you tell them Khidr is alive, you believe in Khidr. And he's a couple of thousand years old. Number two, Elias. Elias was a prophet of Allah. He's alive. They believe he's alive till right now. All Muslims believe this. And subhanAllah, there is a hadith from Imam al-Sadiq that says, he speaks about al-Khidr. He speaks about Imam al-Mahdi's long life. And then he speaks about al-Khidr. He says, the only reason Allah prolonged the life of Khidr so that, uh, so that you, that we can use it as proof against them when they say, how is your Imam living 1,000 years? You tell them Khidr is alive. So Allah used... He placed Al-Khidr so that we can use him to what? To prove Imam Al-Mahdi is also alive. There's nothing wrong with someone living too long if Allah wants that. And by the way, we have a hadith that Al-Khidr is always with Imam Al-Mahdi And wherever the Imam goes, he helps the Imam in Al-Ghaybat Al-Kubra. So Al-Khidr number one. Number two, Ilyas. And they narrate a hadith that every year, subhanAllah, Khidr and Ilyas, they go to Hajj. And they meet each other in Hajj. And if any of you have been to Hajj, you know that after you finish your A'mal, you have to shave your head, correct? You have to shave your hair. They say in the hadith, they narrate this, not us, that Khidr and Ilyas, they meet and then they shave each other's heads. So Khidr shaves the head of Ilyas and Ilyas shaves the head of Al-Khidr. Now fine, we accept this because they're prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
These are two prophets in this world. We have two prophets that are alive, you tell them, but they are in the heavens. Whom? They never died. Prophet Isa, every Muslim believes that Prophet Isa is alive. He did not die. The Holy Quran clearly says that. Number two, Prophet Idris. They all believe Prophet Idris is still alive. He's in the heavens with probably Prophet Isa. So you tell them, wait a minute. This is a long list of prophets that you believe they live such long lives. Some of them are still alive. You believe in that, but then you mock Al-Mahdi. This is not someone who wants to, uh, to find the haq. This is someone that just wants to speak against us and just wants to make commotion and chaos. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah sayyidina. Ahlan wa sahlan. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So this is number two. You tell them we have prophets that are still alive. Number three, you tell them what? Ashab al-Kahf. Do not you believe in Ashab al-Kahf? Ashab al-Kahf, how many years did they sleep in that cave? The Holy Quran says 309 years. How can a human being sleep for 309 years? Isn't this a myth? Isn't this a joke? You believe in it, it's in the Quran, so why not believe in Al-Mahdi? And finally, you can use this as the best proof. The Muslims, the Sunni Muslims, they believe that at the Dajjal, at the Dajjal, the one-eyed Dajjal, who will come with Imam Al-Mahdi and he will be the leader of the forces of evil, he'll fight against Imam Mahdi after Imam Mahdi appears. They believe that Dajjal was born before Rasulullah and he's alive, he's hiding right now and he'll come when Imam Mahdi comes. So how old is Dajjal? He's at least 14, 1500 years old. You believe in Dajjal, he has such a long life. But with Imam Mahdi, the son of Rasulullah, you say it's impossible? So you see, you just bring them these proofs that you show them there is absolutely nothing wrong, nothing abnormal about Imam al-Mahdi living such a long life. We have, when we have such a long list. And finally, finally, who else do we have that's still alive today? He's a friend to some of us. Inshallah, no one here but some human being. Shaytan, Iblis. Iblis is still alive today, correct? How old is he? Don't, no offense, inshallah, no, no one here befriends the Iblis, so it was just a joke. So shaitan, how old is he? Allah told him that I will let you live until الوقت المعلوم Either that's the day the imam reappears or a day of judgment. Iblis is probably 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 years old. We believe in that. So Imam al-Mahdi, no. Iblis, yes, Imam al-Mahdi, no. Come on. So this is number one. Imam al-Mahdi's long life, there is nothing abnormal about it. We have many prophets and other individuals that have long lives like Imam al-Mahdi. So now we come to the second misconception. The second question that's raised about Imam al-Mahdi in Zaman al-Ghaybah. The second question is, can we see Imam al-Mahdi in Zaman al-Ghaybah al-Kubra or not? This is a very important question. Can we see him? Can we meet him? Can we sit with him or no? Here you will find two views between the ulama. The first view, some ulama, they say, no, impossible. No one can see Imam al-Mahdi in Zaman al-Ghaybat al-Kubra. He's there, he's alive, he's amongst us. We just can't see him. Why? Allah wanted it that way. This is the first view. The second view, which most ulama believe in, is that no, it is possible to see Imam al-Mahdi in Zaman al-Ghaybat al-Kubra. But it's very rare. It's very difficult to see. Most of us, we will not see Imam al-Mahdi. Only those close servants of Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may give them that honor in their lives once or twice, one minute, two minutes, they will see Imam al-Mahdi. But for most human beings, no. They will not have the honor to meet Imam al-Mahdi and sit, sit with Imam al-Mahdi. Now, what's the proofs that we can use and understand uh, of these two opinions? When you come to the first view of the ulama, they say, nope, it's impossible for anyone to see the Imam. You ask them why? They tell you the tawqi' of Imam al-Mahdi that he gave to Ali ibn Muhammad al-Samari that we mentioned yesterday. We said that six days before Ali ibn Muhammad al-Samari, the fourth ambassador died, a tawqi', a letter from Imam al-Mahdi was sent to Ali ibn Muhammad al-Samari. He told him, you're going to die in six days. He told him, do not appoint anyone after me. And then he told him this. He says, فَإِنَّكَ مَيِّتٌ مَا بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَ سِتَّةَ أَيَّامٍ فَلَا تُوصِي إِلَىٰ أَحَدًا يَقُومْ مَقَامَكَ بَعْدِكَ And then he said this, فَلَا ظُهُورَ إِلَّا بَعْدَ إِذْنِ اللَّهِ He says, I will not appear until Allah accepts, until Allah wants. And then the Imam says, وَذَلِكَ بَعْدَ طُولِ الْأَمَدِ وَقَسْوَةِ الْقَلْبِ وَامْتِلَاءِ الْأَرْضِ جَوْرَ he said, I will not appear again until three things happen. Number one, a, a huge amount of time has to pass. Thousands of years maybe. Number two, qaswat al-qalb. The hearts will harden. Because when the imam is not there, you can't see him. Of course, the hearts will harden and will go far away from Allah. And number three, he said, wa al-ardi jawra. The world will be filled with injustice. Only then I will reappear. 
And then the Imam said this. After he said there will be no fifth ambassador, Ghaybat al-Kubra will begin. No one, I will reappear only when Allah wants. And then he said this. He said, وَسَيَأْتِي لِشِيعَتِي مَنْ يَدَّعِي الْمُشَاهَدَ He says, now that I will go into the big Ghaybah, some people will come to my Shia and they will claim Mushahada. What is Mushahada? These ulama, they say, Mushahada here means saw. Some people will come to my Shia and they will claim that they saw me. And then the Imam, he says this. He says, أَلَا فَمَنِ الدَّعَ الْمُشَاهَدَةَ قَبْلَ خُرُوجِ السُّفْيَانِ وَالصَّيْحَ فَهُوَ كَذَّابٌ مُفْتَرِي He says, some people will come to my Shia. They will claim that they saw me. According to this tafsir, they saw me. Mushahada is they saw me because we'll get to this. Whoever claims Mushahada, they saw me before Sufyani appears, before Sayha of Jibra'il, and we'll speak about that and the signs of reappearance later. That person is a liar and imposter. They tell you this hadith is very clear. The Imam says, whoever claims he saw me before I reappear, then that person is a liar. And that's why no one can see Imam al Mahdi in Zaman al Ghaybat al Kubra. Now, this is the first view. The second view of most ulama, they say no. It is possible to see the imam. So what do we do with this hadith? First of all, they tell us anytime we want to understand the hadith, we want to evaluate the hadith, we have to look at the sanad. The sanad is what? The chain of narrators. Is this sahih or not sahih? Some ulama, they have said that this, this hadith is not sahih. Why? Because who is narrating this hadith to begin with? Shaykh Al-Tusi, he mentions it in Al-Ghaybah. He narrates it from a man by the name of Al-Hasan ibn Ahmad Al-Mukattab. When we go back to the books of Rijal, we find no one has said that this is an authentic person, reliable person. No one has said he's thiqa. So how can we rely on him? And that's why Sayyid Al-Khoi, he says he's majhul. This narrator is majhul. We cannot rely on him. No one has said he's honest and trustworthy and reliable. So that's number one. Other ulama, they have said no. This hadith, we can accept it. Why? Either because Ahmad ibn al-Hasan al mukaddam we believe he's thiqa. Why is he thiqa? Because a shaykh al-Saduq, he relied on him. A shaykh al-Saduq, what? A shaykh al-Saduq, he said rahimahullah about him. May Allah have mercy upon him. And a shaykh al-Saduq will not say may Allah have mercy upon someone who's what? Who's unauthenticated. So obviously a shaykh al-Saduq accepted him. When a shaykh al-Saduq says about someone, Allah rahma, that means he accepts him. That means he's thiqa. Other ulama, they have said this tawqiyah, we are sure that this, the imam said this. Why? Because no alim during that time, Ghaybat al-Sughra, objected to this tawqiyah. We didn't hear from any alim saying this tawqiyah is what? We doubt this tawqiyah. Who said this tawqiyah? All the ulama, they accepted this tawqiyah. So we cannot speak about the sanad of this hadith. So this is debatable. Let's say this, this, is hadith, this hadith is sahih. After we finish the sanad, we go to the dilala. Dilala is the hadith itself. What is the Imam saying in this hadith? Because sometimes some people, they, say they, claim, they claim something. They bring you a hadith while they have not understood the hadith. This is not what the Imam is saying. Because anytime we look at the hadith, we have to first understand the Arabic of the hadith. What is the Imam saying? We have to understand the context of the hadith. If you take out the context, you will not understand what the Imam is saying. So when we come to this hadith, the second group of ulama, the majority, they say the word mushahada here, we have to put it under examination. What is the word mushahada here? The first group they claim to see. Whoever claims mushahada, see me, that person is a liar. The second group they say no. Mushahada does not mean see in this hadith. What does the imam mean in this hadith? He means something else. What? I'll get to that. Why does he mean mushahada? They tell you number one, mushahada doesn't mean see because first of all, we have tens of ulama in al ghaybat al-Kubra. They saw the imam. Reports, hundreds of reports of ulama, big ulama, close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maraja. They claim that they saw the imam. So wait, we're going to say all these people are liars. This is impossible. So that means the hadith, the imam is saying something else. Because many ulama, like Alam al-Hilli, they say he saw the imam. Like for example, Sayyid ibn Tawus, Al-Muqaddas al-Ardabili, Sayyid Bahr al-Ulum, and the list continues. In Bihar al-Anwar, the entire volume, he lists the people that what? Reports of people seeing Imam al-Mahdi in al-Ghaybat al-Kubra. So it's not to see. That's number one. Number two, we have a hadith from the imams that there are some people that see the Imam Ghaybat al-Kubra. Like what? One hadith from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, لا بد لصاحب الأمر من غيبة. He says that the Imam al-Mahdi, he will go into a غيبة. And then he says, وَمَا بِثَلَاثِينَ مِنْ وَحْشَةِ He says, Imam al-Mahdi, 
In al ghaybah he will always have 30 companions. We think the Imam is alone? No. We said Khidr is with him. 30 companions are with him. They are called the Abdal. When they die, Allah renews them. So next generation will be from the Abdal. 30 companions are always with the Imam. So they're seeing him, yes? So there are some people that see the Imam. Yes, not everyone, but some can see the Imam. This one hadith. Another hadith also we have from Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam that tells us Imam al-Sadiq in the hadith I mentioned, he said Imam al-Mahdi will have two ghaybahs, one short, one long. He said in the long ghaybah, no one will know his location except the close companion of his. So if there are some close companions of Imam al-Mahdi that know his location, then obviously they can see him. You know where he is, but you can't see him. So we have a hadith, we have reports of ulama that no, it is possible to see Imam al-Mahdi in al-Ghaybat al-Kubra. But it's very rare and very difficult. So when we come to the word mushahada, the Imam doesn't mean whoever saw me is a liar. No, there's another meaning. What? There's one of four meanings, four opinions about this hadith. You see? When we come to study that hadith, how difficult it is. Sometimes we spend a month just trying to understand one hadith, and sometimes we take one look and we think, oh, this is what the Imam's trying to say. So four meanings to this hadith. I want you to pay close attention because these meanings, some of them are delicate. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The first meaning, when Imam said, فَمَنِ الدَّعَى الْمُشَاهَدَ فَهُوَ كَذَّابٌ مُفْتَرِ these most ulama, they say, the imam, when he says mushahada, he means whoever claims he's an ambassador. He's telling Ali ibn Muhammad as somebody, the fourth ambassador, you are the final ambassador, do not appoint anyone after you. And then he says, whoever says I saw the imam, whoever says mushahada, meaning on a regular basis, he sits and sees the imams, he's a liar. So the imam is speaking about ambassadors. There are no more ambassadors. Remember we said we have to look at the context. The letter is to an ambassador. The imam is saying there's no more ambassadors. But then he says some people will claim we saw the imam, meaning we are ambassadors. So many ulama, they say in this hadith, the imam is saying there is no more ambassadors. Mushahada means whoever sees the imam on a regular basis every day, meaning he's an ambassador. And that's why after the fourth ambassador, if we can please have these children sit down, please. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And that's why after the fourth ambassador, until the Imam reappears, inshallah, there is no fifth ambassador. Right now, today, I remember I mentioned this man, Gweta, Ahmed Gweta, who says, I am the Yamani. He says, I am Safir, Imam Al Mahdi. Go on his website, he says, I am Safir. You tell him this hadith says, no. Whoever claims that I am the Safir, meaning on a regular basis, see the Imam, this person is a liar and the imposter. So, this is the first meaning that some ulama understood. A second meaning that some ulama understood the Imam didn't say, no one will see me. The Imam said, whoever yadda'i al-mushahada, whoever claims he saw me. So that means you can see the Imam, but just don't claim you saw the Imam. Whoever sees the Imam, he doesn't claim. Whoever claims he saw the Imam, he's a liar. So many ulama we have, they saw the Imam, but they would never say it. Don't publicly go and announce it in front of the people that I saw the Imam. Yes, maybe they would tell their close friends only in secret gatherings. Or maybe someone would find out that he saw the Imam. But whoever comes in the microphone says, I saw Imam al-Mahdi. Imam al-Mahdi speaking about these people. Whoever publicly announces, yadda'i, claims that he saw the Imam, this person is a liar and an imposter. Why would the Imam say that? You could see me, but you can't announce it. Because the Imam knew there will be many imposters. They will come, they told you, you know what, yesterday, I can come right now in the member, tell you yesterday, I saw Imam Mahdi. You know what he told me? He told me, give me one million dollars or else you're all going to hell. How can you reply to me? Are you, you know I'm lying? There's no way to know I'm lying. Imam Mahdi says, whoever goes on the member says, I saw Imam Mahdi and he told me such and such. This person is a liar. Do not believe him. He's trying to what? He's trying to benefit from this. He's trying to take advantage of the fact that he saw me. Any person that tries to benefit, take advantage from the fact that he saw Imam Mahdi, he's a liar. But if I see Imam Mahdi and I just what? And I just cherish those moments, there's nothing wrong with that. So this is the second opinion. The third opinion that many ulama they say, they say Imam al-Mahdi says, whoever claims mushahada, mushahada means you see and you recognize. We can all see the Imam. Maybe all of us here have seen the Imam. But when we saw him, we did not recognize him, correct? And there are two ahadith that tell us about this. One hadith from the second ambassador, Uthman, Muhammad ibn Uthman al-Amri. What does he say in the hadith? He says, إِنَّ صَاحِبْ هَذَا الْأَمْرِ يَحْضَرُ الْمُوسِمْ كُلَّ سَنَةً وَيَرَوْنَكُمْ وَيَعْرِفُكُمْ وَتَرَوْنَهُ وَلَا تَعْرِفُونَ He says, Imam al-Mahdi goes to Hajj every single year. 
He sees you, he knows you, and you see him as well, but you don't know him. Whoever has went to Hajj here, maybe you saw Imam al-Mahdi. But you did not know this is Imam al-Mahdi because his identity is concealed. You saw a pious man, you thought it was just a normal man, this was Imam al-Mahdi. So this hadith says it's possible to see Imam Mahdi, but you won't recognize him. Another hadith from Imam al-Sadiq, he tells his companions about the ghaybah and how the Imam will be in the state of ghaybah. He tells them the ghaybah of Imam al-Mahdi is like the ghaybah of Yusuf. Prophet Yusuf, when his brothers came, he was Aziz Masr. Did they recognize him? No. They thought this was just a stranger while he was their brother. So they saw their brother, but they did not recognize him. He tells them, this is how Imam al-Mahdi is. You can see him. He tells them Imam al-Mahdi walks in the, in the markets, in the streets, but you cannot recognize him. So based on these two ahadith, they say that you can see the Imam. Maybe many of us saw it, saw Imam al-Mahdi. But you cannot recognize him. So when Imam Mahdi says, Mushahada, no one will see me and recognize me. And that's why when you go back to the stories of the ulama that saw Imam Mahdi, you'll see all of them. They only understood this is the Imam after the Imam left. When they saw him, they did not recognize him. Because the Imam says, whoever claims that he saw me and he recognized me when he saw me, this person is a liar. You could see me and not recognize me. This is the third view. And finally, the last view the word mushahada does not mean view, means present. What do we mean present? Come back to the Quran. Allah says in the Holy Quran about Shahr Ramadan. Shahr Ramadan, الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان And then Allah says, فمن شهد فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصم Whoever شهد the month, he has to fast. What is the word شهد? People think شهد, whoever saw the moon. No. Go back to the tafasir. Shahida means whoever was present, was not traveling. You're either in shuhud or you are in safar, in travel. So shahida means you are present. Alimul ghaybi wa shahada. Don't we say alimul ghaybi wa shahada? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the, he knows everything about the ghayb, the hidden, and the shuhud, whatever is present. So shuhud means presence. So Imam al-Mahdi here is saying, whoever claims that I am present, meaning I have come out of the ghaybah, before the Sufyani and before the Sayyah of Jibra'i, this person is lying. So the Imam says, if someone right now comes and says, Imam Mahdi has appeared, he's a liar. Why? Because Sufyani hasn't appeared yet. Because the Sayyah of Jibra'il hasn't appeared yet, hasn't come yet. So the Imam is not speaking about seeing, he's speaking about the reappearance of himself. So these are four different meanings of this hadith. Which one is it? But it depends on the ishtihad and the understanding of the alim himself. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And number three, the third question that comes to the mind of many of us, and this is an area of controversy, is when will Imam al-Mahdi reappear? How many times have we thought about this question throughout our lives? Ya sahib al-zaman, al-ajal, 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 when will you come back? When will Imam al-Mahdi reappear? When we go back to the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, you will find the Ahlul Bayt when they were asked, the ashab would ask about Imam al-Mahdi because the Imams would tell them that he will go into ghaybah. They would ask Imam al uh, the different Imams, when will Imam al-Mahdi reappear and build that beautiful government of Ahlul Bayt, establish it? When will that happen? The Imams always gave one answer. What did they say? كَذِبَ الْوَقَّاتُونَ كَذِبَ الْوَقَّاتُونَ كَذِبَ الْوَقَّاتُونَ Whoever tells you Imam al-Mahdi will reappear on this day, in this time, the Imam said, this person is a liar. Stay away from him. This is what? This is a question mark to place on that person. You're lying. Because all the Imams, many a hadith, I could bring you 20 hadith. Any Imam was asked, when will Imam al-Mahdi reappear? They used to say, كَذِبَ الْوَقَّاتُونَ We don't know. The Imams used to say, we won't tell you. Now, did they not know? This is an area of dispute. Maybe they knew, but they did not want to tell the Shia. They used to say, whoever tells you Imam al-Mahdi will reappear on this day, this person is a liar. So any reports you hear, my dear brothers and sisters, of this person saying, oh, Imam al-Mahdi is going to appear this year, Imam al-Mahdi is going to appear this time, all of this is nonsense. Because the Imams told us, كَذِبَ الْوَقَّاتُ No one knows but Allah and maybe Imam al-Mahdi himself when Imam al-Mahdi will reappear. Now the question is why? Why didn't Ahl al-Bayt just tell us? Right now it's what? It's the year 1437 after Hijrah. Why didn't they tell us, for example, Imam al-Mahdi is going to appear the year 1500, 2000, 10,000, whatever. Why? 
Why did they keep it a secret? What's the philosophy behind the fact that they did not tell us when the Imam will reappear? Three answers here, three reasons. Number one, the first reason is because Ahlul Bayt did not tell us when the Imam is going to reappear just in the same way that no one knows when they will die. So that we are always prepared for Imam al -Mahdi. You see, why didn't Allah tell us when we will die? So that we're always prepared for death. If Allah tells you that you're going to die when you're 90, yeah, you're going to spend your entire life wasting time and going after your desires. And then when you're 89, you turn to Allah. Correct? Allah wants you to always be ready. I could die tomorrow. Likewise, Allah didn't tell you if you're going to die young because you're going to be sad your whole life. Imagine you're born, they tell you, oh, you're going to die when you're 20. You're going to spend your whole life crying. So Allah wanted you uh, to relax. Whenever death comes, it comes. Always be prepared. That's the point. The same philosophy applies about what? The same philosophy applies about Imam al-Mahdi. The Imams wanted us to always be ready for Imam al-Mahdi. If they would have told us he's going to appear, what? In 5,000 years from now, khalas, we're going to say Imam al-Mahdi, not even my 100th grandson is going to see him. So he doesn't have to do with me. No. Every one of us here has hope that I will see Imam al-Mahdi, that he will reappear in my time. And that's why I will try to prepare for Imam al-Mahdi. How do we prepare? I'll speak about that in a different lecture. So this, anytime you don't know when something's going to happen, you're always what? You're always prepared. This is number one. Number two, the second reason why they didn't tell Ahlul Bayt. Think about it. Right now, how many years the Ghaybah of Imam al-Mahdi? Over 1200 years, correct? Now the Shia of Ahlul Bayt, ever since Imam Ali's Khilafah was usurped, Imam Hussein was killed in Ashura, the Shia of Ahlul Bayt were always under pressure from the government. They were killed, they were tortured, their money was stolen, they were always prosecuted. They used to come to the Imams, they used to tell the Imam al-Sadiq, Imam al-Baqir, Imam al-Rada, when will the government of Ahlul Bayt come? When will Imam al-Mahdi be born? When will he come and he will establish that country? That, that beautiful government of his. In the Ahadith you find that the Shia, they were so eager, they were desperately waiting because they were under oppression of the Zalimeen. Now imagine Ahlul Bayt would have come and tell them, you know what, the government of Ahlul Bayt will be in 5,000 years from now. Can you imagine what this will do to the, to the spirit of these Shia? This will completely kill their eagerness for Imam Mahdi. 5,000 years, I ha we have to bear this destruction, we have to bear this oppression. So the Imams didn't want them to what? To lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why they did not tell them when Imam Mahdi will reappear. And there's a beautiful hadith. There's a conversation between Ali ibn Yaqteen, who is a companion of Imam al-Kadhim al-Rida, and his father Yaqteen. Yaqteen was with Bani al-Abbas. His son Ali ibn Yaqteen is with Ahlul Bayt. So Yaqteen, he tells his son Ali ibn Yaqteen, how come we have a hadith from Rasulullah that you narrate from your imams that Bani al-Abbas will have a government. Rasulullah said, Bani al-Abbas, my nephews, they will have a government. And my cousins. And we also, you also have a hadith that you Ahlul Bayt, you'll have a government. Our government happened, Bani al-Abbas, their government happened 100 years after Rasulullah. Your government hasn't happened yet. What's the problem? How come this happened, this didn't happen? Ali ibn Yaqteem, he gave him this answer that he heard from Imam al-Kadhim. He told him, look, both of them are from Rasulullah. So both of them are right. The only difference is your time came. The time of Bani al-Abbas government came. Our time hasn't come yet. The time of the government of Ahlul Bayt hasn't come yet. If Ahlul Bayt would have said, Bani al-Abbas government is in 100 years, our government is in 2,000 years. This, of course, the Shia, they would do kufr. They would apostatize. What? Bani al-Abbas 100 years, we 5,000 years. We don't want this to Shia. They'd go and they'd, become, they'd follow other people. So to preserve the faith of the Shia, they did not want people to despair. They did not tell them when the Faraj will be. This is number two. And finally, number three, and we'll end with this. The third reason why Ahlul Bayt didn't tell us when Imam al-Mahdi will reappear is because of al-Bada. Or when, yeah, when Imam al-Mahdi will reappear, it's because of al-Bada. Al-Bada, I spoke about it last year, entire lecture. Allah sometimes informs us of some things and then He erases it. He changes it. Imagine Imams of Ahlul Bayt would have told us Imam al-Mahdi will appear in 1999. And then all of a sudden Allah does Bada. He erases it. He says, no, 2099. 1999 comes. We see there's no Imam al-Mahdi. What will we say? The Imams lied. They didn't lie. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed matters. This is called Bada. We believe in Bada. And if you want to understand it, I have a lecture about Bada I gave last year and it's on YouTube. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes he will change. So if Allah may change it, why give a date and then it will it may change and then I will turn out to be like a liar. And that's why in one hadith when the Imam was asked, why do you not give us a time? 
What did the Imam say? He said, كَذِبَ الْوَقَّاتُونَ And then he said the story of Prophet Musa. What is it? He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa, come to the mountain 30 days for the miqat. He told Bani Israel, I will go for 30 days and come back. When he went to the, to the mountain, Allah, he did bada. He added 10 days. He told him, not 30 days, 40 days. The 30th day came, they saw Musa is nowhere to be found. 31, they said, what? Musa lied to us. He said 30 days, he's not here. What did they do? They went and they started to do sujood and prostrate to the calf, the ajal. So when he came back, he saw they had all apostatized. He said, for this reason, the Imam, Allah, did not, uh, or we Ahlul Bayt do not give a time for the reappearance of the Imam. So if Bada happens, the Shia don't say, oh, the Imams lied, and they begin to despair in the hope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are three questions that we understand about Zaman al Ghaybat al Kubra. There are two important questions left. Number one, why did Imam al Mahdi go in the state of Ghaybah? And number two, how can we benefit from an Imam that's in the state of Ghaybah? We will address that inshallah tomorrow. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq that we continue in the footsteps of Ahlul Bayt and Imam al Mahdi Abdullah ta'ala farajah al Sharif. And I ask him to accept all our a'mal and our siyam. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin.